Well, I'm here with uh, two great guests, uh, two individuals that I've had on on my uh, radio program on FM and AM, but I thought in light of this week's events in which the topic of critical race theory breached the uh, discussion for the uh, presidential debates, which is a very interesting moment in American history uh, to have this theory kind of enter the zeitgeist at the mainstream level. Christopher Wallace brought up critical race theory uh, in response to President Trump's recent uh, stated ban for this kind of uh, theory being taught in federal agencies. Um, so we, we're going to get into this today, and I've got uh, two great guests. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Rechtenwald, who's the author of Beyond Woke, uh, which delves into the topic of critical theory. Uh, Michael used to be a Marxist professor at NYU, uh, and he was uh, thinking about becoming a Trotskyist, but he had a kind of an experience with victimology and cancel culture related to critical theory that we can get into. We also have mathematician James Lindsay, who is the uh, author of the new book, uh, Cynical Theories, correct? You have a copy, both of you guys got a copy of the book yeah. for folks who want to check them out, yeah. So these are two gr excellent uh, texts that kick on different angles of this growing phenomenon. And whether you're a student or maybe you're, you have a son or a daughter who's engaging in these ideas, it's time to understand these things. So thank you both for joining me. And uh, we'll start with Dr. Rechtenwald. Uh, just tell us a little bit about your background in this uh, space. And, and then we'll just ask some questions about critical race. Sure. Uh, well, I have a PhD in literary and cultural studies, which uh, it really treats all of these theories, critical uh, race theory, uh, critical theory itself, postmodern theory, uh, and uh, basically science studies, which is uh, one of the uh, sort of social and philosophical uh, discourses related to the study of science. And um, so uh, I have, uh, and I taught at NYU, I taught uh, social and cultural history and theory. Uh, so um, yeah, I, um, I basically was schooled in, uh, as I say in Springtime for Snowflakes, my memoir, I was schooled in uh, all of these uh, schools of thought, uh, basically you know, slowly but surely indoctrinated into uh, kind of postmodern Marxism. And uh, so, uh, but since have become uh, quite disaffected with it and uh, has since become uh, basically a civil libertarian. And very good. And I, I've, you know, you, you've probably seen Michael, you, you're on Fox News and Tucker and I see you there and James Lindsay, you, you did a real big uh, experience with Joe Rogan, right, recently and that was huge. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about your background in this space. So unlike Michael, I didn't um, go into this the straight way. I fell ass backwards into it is the only real way to put it. Um, a few years ago, I, for a variety of reasons that mostly re uh, revolve around seeing my intellectual heroes getting bullied, I agreed with a colleague of mine, Peter Bogosian, to uh, try to attempt a hoax on gender studies, which I guess we could consider a form of critical theory if we, we want to understand how it's done. And so we attempted an academic hoax. We think that that mostly failed, but we were a little bit too celebratory of uh, our perceived su success. This drew down a lot of controversy and a lot of uh, attention. And then we decided taking the, the criticisms we were given to then amplify and, and attempt to, to um, correct the errors of our experiment and do a better job of it. So we engaged for the next year that started in the middle of 2017 in what would be known as the Grievance Studies Affair now, which hits its second anniversary tomorrow. Um, October 2nd, 2018, we came public with the fact that we had written a bevy of academic papers in the various critical identity studies and uh, had several of them accepted, including a rewrite of a chapter of Mein Kampf in Intersectional Feminism by a social work journal, uh, among others. And that, of course, put us in the spotlight. Uh, we're also clearly getting to be quite well informed on the issue. We understood the scholarship well enough to get seven papers published in a matter of a few months. Mm -hmm. At the academic level, we may have had a handful more had we had 
not been caught by the Wall Street Journal in the midst of our shenanigans. So we clearly demonstrated that we understand the scholarship. We decided to put a firmer foundation under that. And so we studied um, critical theory and postmodern theory in particular backwards. We started with what's going on with the woke phenomenon, if we might call it that today, for example, critical race theory being the, the, the racial dimension of the woke theory or critical social justice as is more formally known. And we started to trace lines backwards. It's, I think, best to understand that this ideology that we're up against today has cherry picked from the critical theory tradition, from the postmodern tradition, from uh, liberal traditions of social justice, from liberalism itself to concoct a rather horrifying totalitarian ideology that we worked backwards to explain. And so over the past couple of years, my colleague Helen Pluckrose and I, who helped with the grievance studies affair, um, did our due diligence to really understand where this modern ideology came from. And in particular, we wrote the book Cynical Theories to outline the postmodern dimension of that. We touch upon critical theory, which we're also fairly conversant in, but we focused on the postmodern element because we think that that's what allowed for it to become as effective as it is at what it does. So let's just kick things off where a lot of folks are learning for the first time when they watch this 70 million people debate, you know, 70 million people watch this debate or so, and they're hearing Christopher Wallace, who is, uh, you know, comes from a high pedigree of journalistic uh, prestige, and he says, you know, he, he, he brings up this critical race theory in, in reference to, and we can get into a little bit of the background, but just kind of want to get right off the top of the, of the, of the discussion here. Christopher Wallace kind of framed it, and I don't have the full quote with me on hand, and we can fact check it if I get it wrong, but he basically said it's racial sensitivity training. Um, so I just wanted to ask you guys, and start with Michael first, is critical race theory just racial sensitivity training? Well, I mean, critical race theory is, uh, you might say it's the, you know, theoretical undergirding of that, but it goes much further than critical, than sensitivity training. It goes into uh, a, a whole uh, panoply of discussion about what is uh, race and what constitutes race uh, and what makes up racism, you know. And so it is, it does derive out of the critical theory school in that critical theorists suggested that the totality of the social order uh, was oppressive and mm -hmm. that you had to use a negative dialectic to oppose those positive negativities, if you will those positive imp uh, impediments to liberation. And so it derives this sort of uh, negative dialectic and, and, and brings it into the uh, ambit of race. And uh, rather than seeing race as like an aspect of society as just simply uh, a particular phenomenon of the social order and, and particularly legal studies as well, it sees race as all determining this is the key. It's, it's something that determines the whole. It is, uh, it is not simply some sort of a facet of society. It is, the, it is an all-determining totality that reaches into every aspect uh, and uh, informs all experience, uh, including the experience of white people and, and non-racial uh, others, as they would put it, or subalterns. Um, so no, it's much more than that. It's much more thoroughgoing uh, and uh, there's a couple things about it. One of them is that it sees race everywhere that, that I've more or less said, but also that um, the whole social body and everybody's experiences are constructed around this whole idea of race. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you're experiencing, for example, all three of us are experiencing the property that is uh, attendant upon being white. That is a kind of, uh, I call it a kind of a, credit card of whiteness that you can spend at will according to critical race theory that you it looks invisible because you don't see the funds but you can draw on them and you draw them on them at all times uh, and this this is an uh a disadvantage this this goes against the very idea of uh, equity right so equality is not sufficient uh, under this idea and legal equality is not sufficient in fact critical race theory sees legal equality itself, this colorblind equality, as a form of oppression in its own, in its own right. right. Uh, it goes that far. 
And, you know, so that uh, this is where all these notions of like microaggressions come from. Uh, this kind of uh, supposed attitudinal uh, response of every white person to every black person in every situation. Uh, everything is informed by race through and through. And so what critical race theory training does when it's implemented, it's, it's you know, I mean, they're not teaching this, this high theory. They're teaching basically the idea that the system is entirely racist. Every white person is necessarily racist, whether they know it or not. They, have, they harbor unconscious biases and they act on them in almost inscrutable ways. Uh, such that even, you know, walking into a store and you don't see the black person in front of you in line for something, for example, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, one of the inaugural essays in the field uh, was about how uh, dolls for children, dolls were more expensive uh, for white people. The white dolls cost more than black dolls. So they saw this as a uh, fact that black bodies were cheapened in society because black dolls uh, on average cost less than white dolls. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas there's other explanations economically for that. Uh, they would say that any other explanation is racist and it's part and parcel of the whole racist uh, structure. Well, James, yeah, just kind of building on where Michael went with that. Yeah, I looked at the transcript just to make sure. Yeah, Chris Wallace says, uh, you know, he's referring to Trump, that your administration directed federal agencies to end racial sensitivity training that addresses white privilege or critical race theory. Why did you decide to do that, to end racial sensitivity training? And do you believe there is systemic racism in this country, sir? He follows that up with what is radical about racial sensitivity training. So somebody, I don't know what focus group Mike Chris Wallace was, was, uh, Consulting, but he had a nice language there. He was like racial sensitivity training. Mm -hmm. So I throw it to you, James. Is this yeah, we've seen sensitivity this, training. We've seen this specific piece of gaslighting throughout the uh, dominant media. As a matter of fact, uh, almost immediately after Trump issued the executive order and the first uh, OMB memo went out within the federal government uh, following his his declaration that he was going to do an EO on this we saw the media starting to spin it that Trump is trying to shut down racial sensitivity training. This was the preferred um, MOT, if you will, the highly defensible uh, variant uh, to the Bailey of the much more radical critical race theory. So it's like actually very important for people who want to, to deal with this issue to recognize that Chris Wallace has done something dishonest. He has claimed falsely that critical race theory, in fact, is even an approach to racial sensitivity training, which I think is incorrect. It is an approach to critical race theory sensitivity training. Is You either agree with the critical race theory or you're a racist, uh, and therefore it makes you sensitive around the, the, the proclamations and dogmas of critical race theory, not around race. He is also, even if we were to accept that it does approach the issue of racial sensitivity in a particularly bad way, it's still that would be one tree in a very broad forest of potential approaches to uh, racial sensitivity training. So calling out this lie and demanding repeatedly that the real three word phrase, critical race theory be used is, is of incredible importance. And this is typically what you actually see out of uh, these critical theories like uh, critical race theory in particular, they are very, very good at forwarding a very kind of benign or even beneficent uh, tiny corner of what they purport to do and claim that it's representative of the whole until people stop looking at them and stop scrutinizing them and stop holding their feet to the fire, at which point they continue to do this very radical view, which Michael described very well. It's a very totalizing view where, uh, for example, critical race theory, um, its core assumptions were described by Michael quite well. Uh, if you read its core texts, like uh, Critical Race Theory and Introduction by Delgado and Stefanczyk, you can see uh, immediately that they are very nice for you and they list their core assumptions, their core tenets. Uh, different authors list different ones, but there is a lot of overlap. We summarize these in Cynical Theories in Chapter 5 for anybody who wants to see. We give three different examples. The overlap is considerable. And in all of them, we have the core assumption that's usually listed first. It's listed first in, in Delgado and Stefanczyk's Critical Race Theory Introduction, 
that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society. This has been distilled down into uh, being that racism can be found in all aspects of society. When you derive from the critical theory school, the idea is that these impediments to progress or these, these oppressive uh, dynamics don't improve with time. They, there is no genuine progress. They only mean uh, succeed in hiding themselves more successfully. And the point of the critical method is to unearth the, the, the now hidden uh, racism that's, according to its view, just as bad as it was during Jim Crow, just as bad as it was during segregation, just as bad as it was during slavery, as a matter of fact. And so this has been further refined into a simple question that uh, Robin D'Angelo, best-selling author of White Fragility, wrote in a, she said it many times in different public appearances, but she wrote it, I think, for the first time in a 2013 paper, in the very beginning of the paper, she says that because of the way that critical race theory engages with the question of race and racism in society, the question is no longer did racism take place, but how did racism manifest in that situation? That's a direct quote from Robin DiAngelo, repeated direct quote from her. She said it many times. That is the dominant view in critical race theory is that in all interactions, especially cross-racial ones, but in all phenomena, all social phenomena, all institutions, the law, the way that, that even our knowledge generating uh, protocols and apparatuses and methodologies, in all regards, racism is present and it is the job of the critical race theorists to look for it until they can find it and call it out to make it visible and enact social activism to try to overthrow it. Uh, though you'll find when they start to say what to do about things, short of words like disrupt and dismantle, uh, and then actions like giving critical race theorists administrative power, the details are a bit thin on the ground. They never quite really tell anybody what to do as a practical solution except to give them the power, don't worry. They're the ones who understand the problem. They're the only ones who understand the problem. And so for them, when they say racial sensitivity training is what critical race theory is about, they do not mean that in the way that any reasonable human being would understand it. They mean that, which they, that such a reasonable person, uh, human being by definition in critical race theory is also racist because racism is the ordinary state of affairs in all human interactions. Yeah. So, um, they mean, in fact, that you have extraordinary sensitivity to the tenets and dogmas and doctrines of critical race theory and have adopted that lens on the world, your institution, your interactions, your relationships, and apply it to the fullest extent of your understanding, which should always, as again, Robin D'Angelo phrases it, should be always refined in, and this is a quote, again, in a, in a lifelong commitment to an ongoing process of self-reflection, self-critique, and social activism. That's mm -hmm. what they ask of you. This is a permanent uh, condition of critical race consciousness that you must apply in social activism to yourself and uh, in social situations where you work, et cetera, uh, forever. Mm -hmm. So it's not a formal discipline so much as a kind of a lifestyle. It's an experience, a holistic kind of totality of life. That you're so if you to... saw the big article that CNN dropped after the wake of this, CNN went and interviewed, for example, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's one of the architects of critical race theory. And she's very clear to say, as she said since the 1980s repeatedly, it is a practice. In other words, it's a way of viewing the world. It is a way of interacting with the world. It is, a, it is not just kind of high theory. It is, it, it is a complete different worldview. It has its, its own epistemology, its own relationship to knowledge, has its own ethics. The ethics mostly come from critical theory, although uh, the epistemology also comes from critical theory. Postmodernism has dramatically influenced it. Kimberly Crenshaw in Mapping the Margins in 1991, her kind of chief academic paper introducing intersectionality. It's the second one that does so, but it has more, more weight behind it than the earlier. Um, says at the end of that paper <clears throat> that intersectionality is a provisional concept, uh, or is a concept that, that a provisional concept for linking um, contemporary politics, by which she means radical liberationism, in other words, race critical theory, with uh, postmodern theory. So the postmodern theory has been baked into their epistemological and ethical construct uh, in critical race theory as well. In other words, there's no truth, there's just one subjective lived experience, which if it's shackled to a experience of, of systemic oppression or a claim to have lived, lived systemic oppression as the theory outlines it, not as it may manifest in reality, then it is authoritative, and if not, it's absolutely not to be considered. So, so here's going back to the transcript because this is people's entry point into this for a lot of folks. Um, 
who don't, they don't go on, you know, the podcast and so forth, or maybe they're just now stumbling into this. So, so when I'm looking at the text, uh, Chris Wallace says, do you believe there is systemic racism in this country? So he, he, he puts the word systemic racism connected to racial sensitivity. Mm-hmm. And then Biden answers it by saying, you know, there's a back and forth, but Biden basically says, yes, the fact is there is racial insens- insensitivity. So it's like he's got yeah. that canned answer. So the question is, is there systemic racism? And the answer is, yeah, there's just racial insensitivity that we need to change. So, so this word racial sensitivity and insensitivity seems to be this memo going around that this is how we're going to, to, we're going to introduce this to the mainstream by framing the word systemic racism with, yes, racial ins- insensitivity. Mm-hmm. As, this, as if this is the way we're going to gate, we're going to bring this into the mainstream with this loaded language. And I just want to throw this to Michael that, do you see that? Who, who started this memo about racial sensitivity being the word we're going to use for, for introducing this to the mainstream? And is this part of their whole thing of using words to, to do warfare, right? Language is violent. So we're going to use language right. to, to conduct cold yeah, war. Let me just pick up a couple things first, if I can, to sure. the of entry here. It, it is true that uh, this is an, you know, that this is an ongoing, they see this as an ongoing and endless practice. And it's, I would argue that it's basically a ten, it really falls from the idea that whiteness is in effect an inexpiable sin that can't be overcome, uh, that has no solution uh, it's, as such. And I should say that this this underscores a kind of this idea of racial sensitivity and systemic racism underscores a contradiction within the whole field, and that is this: race is seen when when there's no racist in sight as institutional, so it, or as systemic. So they throw it to the system when they can't point to particular individual acts of racism or or what have you. And then it's attitudinal when can you know when when it's found within uh, when it's found a locus, if you will, in a particular individual. So there's this constant parrying back and forth between the, the systemic and the attitudinal. And uh, they would actually argue that the attitudinal is a construct of the system of, of systemic racism. So that when whenever it's found, it has to be. Ex, it has to be uh, extirpated, if you will, but it can't really be extirpated. So it's a constant struggle. This is very convenient for them. Uh, one of the things is I would say that, you know, this Trojan horse of leading with us racial sensitivity training, as opposed to critical uh, race theory, uh, has a great deal to do with the way they enter into the, uh, the establishment, into institutions and uh, find, you know, actually produce jobs for themselves. Actually, I think it really has a lot to do with the fact that they're, they're careerists. Uh, and this is why, as James pointed out, they are, you know, they are the only experts. And uh, this also, you know, their, their, their epistemology with this idea of my lived truth and my experience, my lived experience uh, is very, is very derived from postmodernism. It's a kind of, uh, uh, it comes from standpoint epistemology, first of all, that uh, there's a, a unique standpoint for knowledge that particular individuals have, and particularly the subaltern characters. Those who are subaltern have a, have a particular uh, epistemological standpoint that others can't possibly uh, understand or, or breach. They can't possibly grasp it. So this promotes this idea that lived experience comes first, evidence facts, statistics, all these things are not only considered irrelevant, but also part of systemic racism itself. Uh, so that you can't, you can't win an argument with these people by virtue of pointing out uh, statistical uh, facts, statistical analyses, uh, you know, factual uh, evidence, uh, historical uh, evidence of uh, change, or anything like that, because it comes down to my lived experience. And uh, this is a very convenient and rather, uh, it's, it's almost, it's inviolable because you can't really overthrow it based on their premises. That is their epistemology that 
that there's this unique standpoint that you can't get to unless you're in that body, as they would put it, in a black body. Uh, this black body gives you a unique access to a type of uh, understanding that you can't experience or have. So really it's quite a, despite its postmodern constructivist base, it's quite essentialist when convenient. Uh, it's suggesting that experience is essentially, uh, this is kind of a contradiction, but it's essentially constructed based on properties of the person, uh, but based on essential properties. So uh, they have this argument back and forth between essentialism and constructivism. Essentialism is the idea that there is uh, some essential properties uh, of a person and uh, without which you're not part of a particular group or class. And so for that, the key one here is of course skin tone, skin, skin color. Once you have that particular skin color, uh, you have uh, this essential property which allows you to have this particular unique standpoint which can't be argued with on the basis of any evidence because you can't experience my lived experience. And even suggesting that you understand it is part of the systemic racism as well. There's a, there's a, there's a insurmountable gap. Yeah. It's insurmountable because of the premises that they're, they're, um, that they're positing in the first place. These premises of epistemological, I call it epistemological solipsism uh, because no one else can know your knowledge but you. Uh, therefore, it can't be shared. Uh, there, it's utterly inaccessible to every to anyone else, and it it becomes rather. Uh, although it's based in race in the outset, it also leads to a kind of real individualist sense that my lived experience. And this this cuts into the idea of intersectionality because intersectionality suggests that uh, a particular persons, particularly subalterns, that is those of low status and out, they're outside and beneath. Uh, they are intersected by multiple vectors of power and oppression. And therefore, you know, this particular, uh, the particular configurations of their oppression can all, almost become uh, individual because you could have so many uh, categories of uh, being oppressed. Uh, some of them can be even uh, completely self-constructed. Like, you know, you could say I'm, uh, I'm a neurotype, uh, such such a neurotype, plus I'm black, plus I'm lesbian, plus I'm handicapped, plus I'm, uh, and goes on and on to the point where you get this kind of isolation almost to the individual level. And you get points for each one of those? You get points and uh, this is why the, uh, you know, you know, notoriously dubbed the Prussian Olympics. This is why all the competition for the race to the bottom, because the, the bottom is the top in the oppression Olympics. So I'm going to say this. I mean, I want to know what you guys would think. What would happen if the right brought out, you know, a pan gender Muslim, African American, dwarf, disabled, you know, like if they just stacked so many on, like, what would they do with that? How could, like, I'm just curious how their frame would process that. Like a very articulate false Republican with like seven of yeah. those things just stacked. That person How has false consciousness. Yeah. So the way that they do the essentialism is that they don't say that a person has essentialism in who they happen to be. They say that the person has essentialism in their, in their uh, lived experience of having to, happening to be that person. And so they claim that, say, critical race theory is the dimension with race. We could talk about all the others uh, within the, the you know, oppression Olympics. They, they see that the theory has worked its way toward the correct, authentic description of what lived experience of oppression in that racial or identity category happens to be. And so everybody who speaks in agreement with theory is speaking authentically to, to having that, uh, that category, identity category. And everybody who disagrees with theory is um, speaking from a position of, uh, of somehow being uh, inauthentic. So I say that more carefully than just saying false consciousness because there's also cynical self-interest. That's where you see people being called an Uncle Tom, for example. Mm -hmm. So the point would be that if you were to say, even if we just trotted out, we could use a very simple example of any of these black women that are speaking up very, uh, eloquently against critical race theory that are in the Republican side, they're immediately accused of either being sellouts, in other words, being race traitors of some kind, Uncle Tom's, 
uh, cynically self-interested, seeking white approval. These are all the kinds of phrases that they use much nastier phrases for this as well that, we, that are actually racial slurs we won't repeat. And then at the same time, if they are not that, if, if they want to be more charitable, they say, well, they've been indoctrinated by the system itself. They call it this process of indoctrination socialization. So you hear the theorists come out and say things like, we are all socialized into a racist worldview. And so their belief would be that many people, and in fact, this is the core of their whole ideology, is that many people who suffer oppression have in fact been indoctrinated to accept their oppression, to accept the premises of their oppression. And it is the critical theorist's job to agitate them, to get them to see with a critical consciousness the realities of their oppression. So they have this concept of internalized oppression, which with race is internalized racism, where somebody essentially has a form of false consciousness that they're being, uh, that, so, so they would say that somebody like this is actually repeating white supremacy because they've been misled to believe that that's cr the correct way of the world. So when you see these things like the African American History Museum at the Smithsonian putting out that white culture includes things like productivity and going to work on time and all of these things, these are different, you know, habits that when they say that they, that they can then say that if a, if a black voice speaks on behalf of these, it doesn't matter that that person's black, that person is belying the true experience of oppression, and they therefore have a false consciousness and internalized oppression. For what it's worth, on the other side, they say that critical theories needed, say, in the dominant groups, if that's race, it's white, because they have what's called internalized dominance. They've been trained by society to think that their methods are rigorous, not just a matter of opinion and power. They've been trained to believe that their social status was earned or that, it, that merit is somehow legitimate and has got, helped them to get where they, they are. They have all of these different ways to, to convince both sides of that racial divide, if we want to talk about it that way, of having false consciousness and or cynical self-interest anytime they disagree with theory. It's a little more complicated because like all totalitarian ideologies, it also separates the world into what you might call honored groups and dishonored groups. Mm -hmm. And so the racial identifiers, your demographic realities, categorize you into either an honored group or a dishonored group. But then within that, you have the option of acting authentically, which means according to the way theory describes, or inauthentically, which essentially means that for reasons of ignorance, which might be willful, or for cynical self-interest, that you are, in fact, um, misrepresenting the lived experience that's essential to your group. And so they dodge the essentialism accusation by making the lived experience of being a particular kind of person allegedly essential uh, and thus deterministic of life. But if you were to trot out a Republican or a Libertarian or a Conservative or anybody who even so much as a little bit disagrees with them, um, somebody who came out and said, well, I'm a, I'm a liberal for Trump, for example, and they put on the Make America Great Again hat like Kanye West did. The next day, you, he didn't say he's a liberal for Trump. He just said, I think for myself, put on a mega hat. And then the next day or two days later, something ta Hissy Coates comes out in the Atlantic and says he's, not, he's no longer black. That was the, the response. You know, Pete Buttigieg is straight passing. So there are articles that were genuinely published about him when he was running in the Democratic primary saying that he may sleep with men or be married to a man, but he's not really gay because he doesn't have the proper radical queer politics. Um, and this is genuinely how they see the world. So you couldn't trot out. You can't overwhelm their game by putting you, it was transgender. Just, just a, it's just a token. In a, in a, in a uh, uh, very dwarfen, in a um, mm. wheelchair, Muslim. It helps. Black. I it mean, confuses. if you just stacked it with a hundred, would they be just like, "Whoa, sacred let's, status"? Let's look at it this way. It's kind of like <laughs> a question, you know. This is a bank which, from which the, the the subject can draw, but they have to draw on it. Okay. And as James pointed out, they have to draw on it based on these particular tools. Okay. They have to draw on this toolkit, this critical race theory toolkit, in order to cash in on their subjectivity. If they don't do that then they're basically leaving, uh, it's an, they're, they're leaving it unused and therefore they're disavowing their own experience. They're disavowing so the most, their own. So what's more sacred than all the external identity markers is- The ideology. The yeah. ideology. It's that fealty is the to one, the party. Okay. Yeah, you That's gotta, what you've got to embrace the ideology. This is, in fact, when you see uh, the treatment of people like Candace Owens or uh, the, uh, uh, the president of the, uh, 
Heritage Foundation. These people are treated with more vitriol and hatred than than even white males who dis, you know who disclaim this kind of theory because they are actually uh, they are uh, they're traitors and, and, and to the to the greater extent based on your uh, you know your phenotypical and other uh, markers. If you don't live up to these markers or live down to them, however you might want to put it, then in fact you're more culpable than anybody. Uh, and therefore, you'll, you'll get the vitriol. This is why you see Candace Owens called uh, a white supremacist by Antifa members, for example. Uh, and it reminds me of the trickster archetype from ancient mythology where, you know, they treat them like a trickster, like you are an imposter. You're not real. And it makes them go wild, you know, like. They have to, this, they have to disqualify these people because if they don't, it's a, it's a, it represents a contradiction. It represents a, uh, a, a, an undermining of their entire uh, ethos, their entire uh, MO. Uh, so th these people have to be discredited uh, roundly. They have to be uh, completely denounced. And it's not based, their whole thing, because remember, Chris Wallace just said this was racial sensitivity, and all the media says that. But it's not just about, it's not, it's all about the ideology. It's not about actual results, is it? Because I always like to contrast how they treat Joe Biden versus like a Rand Paul. Rand Paul did more than Joe ever did to end wars that are occupying people of color. So if you're against imperialistic type ideas, then you would want to go with Rand over Biden. Biden bombs people of color. Rand wants to stop bombing people of color. You know, Biden, you know, wrote the crime bill. Rand wants to get rid of the drug war in a lot of ways. So you look at that, you say, wait a second. If you get this guy's stuff, you're going to have less people of color in prison, less people of color you know, militarily occupied around the world. With this guy, you get more of that. But for them, because Biden is allied with critical theorists, therefore he gets yeah. a pass from the violence? Is that how That's it more or less it, yeah. It, the the um, facts of the matter don't matter at all. All that matters really is fealty to the ideology. Your actual demographic characteristics even are secondary. You can kind of think of them as like power-ups. So if you were a black person, you, you who disagrees with critical theory, you're, as Michael said, not only are you just going to be discounted, you're actually going to be attacked as a, as a traitor to your race. Um, but if you happen to go along with critical theory, so you could be a white person who goes along with critical theory or is positioned like Joe Biden, it's not clear that Joe Biden goes along with it or knows what it is. Uh, maybe he doesn't, maybe he doesn't, but it's certainly clear that he's allied with the people who are, and he's, he's pointing in the right directions and saying the right things. You, the allyship status affords you nearly, nearly limitless. It's like uh, a nearly limitless excuse um, or parochial altruism. It's like how there's the saying, you know, the, the, it, it's, I don't remember how it's all constructed, but it's, it's a very nice saying where the, the gist is that I get to make fun of my brother, but nobody outside of my house gets to make fun of my brother. Um, now, so you have somebody like Joe Biden is never going to have honored status, but he can have this preferential treatment under allyship. But if then you had a black person or a person of color or a woman of color, or especially a lesbian woman of color or a queer person of color, which is lesbians are kind of on the outs right now, um, then you would be able to cash in on those identity statuses and the, therefore your honored group status and amplify the strength of your message. So Joe can only ever be an ally. Uh, but Rand Paul is it doesn't matter. He could be he could be black. He could be the whole suite of characteristics that you could imagine. But his ideology is not concurrent with um, critical race theory. You say, oh well, it has some of the similar goals, reducing criminality, uh, you know, criminal incarceration, for example, of people of color. But that doesn't matter because they are utterly concerned about the ideology being installed, and somebody who's going to resist that for individual freedom is now the worst kind of person holding up the status quo. Um, so Rand Paul's it has nothing to do with any of that. You are you are framing this correctly. It is 100% about fealty to the ideology, and then you kind of get power ups by having the right honored group statuses. So it's kind of like a Gnostic religion where you can line up and say, "Excuse me, if you get, I'm just using these characters." No, this is true. This is but true. But if you if you it get Rand, you're going to have less people of color in prison versus Biden. If you get Rand, you're going to have less wars where Sim Yemeni children are starved because he doesn't want to be over there. Biden's okay with, they don't care about flesh and body. They don't have, they don't care about flesh and blood bodies, do they? They care about well, I mean, the he, idea he, above all, right? There's an even starker contrast between uh, Trump and uh, Obama. 
Right. Uh, Obama uh, did nothing, you know, tangible as far as we can say about uh, the status of black people in America. And in fact, drone bombed a teenage boy in uh, the Middle East, a black yeah. uh, American citizen. Yeah, by a 60 year old person of color. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no, uh, but he had, uh, he had a sufficient fealty, although not, he's not, he wasn't parading it around too much. It was clear that he had fealty to the ideology. Uh, he's made, he made statements that were, uh, say, reverse dog whistles, if you will, that would uh, indicate that. But, he, you know, he didn't tout it in a very um, explicit way, but he made it pretty clear that he, he did buy in. But furthermore, he was able to cash in on his blackness uh, and... Uh, it didn't matter whether his policies were actually uh, beneficial uh, to black people or not. And I would argue that Trump's have been more so, uh, at least in terms of economics, uh, at least up until the pandemic. Do, would you say, I want to get you guys to comment quickly on this, because I'm thinking about when you're going to Thanksgiving, you know, with your family members or your sons and daughters or your fellow students at, on campus, when they're thinking about these ideas, um, do, can you believe in can you believe in something called systemic race, uh, racial injustice and not believe in critical race theory? You see what I mean? Um, I would say genuinely that critical race theory is the study of systemic racism. So they are very much so unified as one kind of concept. In fact, as Michael kind of pointed out earlier, the, the, the systemic racism is the name for racism when you don't know where it is. Uh, but even calling it racism is already giving it too much credit. The reality is, if you just look at even what they say, how do you know when systemic racism is present? You just go, go to their literature, go to their arguments. How do you know? It's when racial inequities of certain kinds occur, but not other kinds. For example, that uh, East Asians in the United States outperform white people does not count financially and academically. That does not count. But that white people and East Asians outperform black people and certain demographics within the Hispanic community. Uh, and when I say black people, I have to exclude Nigerian immigrants, of course, um, <laughs> because they outperform African Americans as, as kind of the, the capitalized, you know, politically black that, that um, Nicole Hannah Jones referred to groups and the people that they claim to speak for, that inequity resulted from systemic racism somehow. So when they can point to institutional discrimination, then they do. When they can point to individual racism, then they do. And the thing is, is they have common cause, and this is part of how they're so successful, with a lot of people who see that there are legitimate disparities in treatment, not written explicitly into the law, but there are legitimate disparities in treatment, um, especially hearing racist things throughout your life from time to time more often than others. And so it taps into this, but when they cannot find the locus, then it's the system of racism. It's this vague socialization where, mm -hmm. where people have certain, as, as we often hear, unconscious or implicit attitudes that they don't even realize they're acting upon that must be cumulatively adding up in some kind of very undetectable way that lead to these differences. The most stark way to understand this, of course, was not to talk about systemic racism, but, and this is because of the nature of the public conversation, but rather the, the wealth gap, or the, sorry, the, the gender income gap that's been made so much uh, hay out of. And when you start to actually control for all the variables and you start to put things on equal footing and you actually start to do a very rigorous analysis rather than a very superficial analysis, this so-called 77 cents on the dollar or 72 or whatever the number happens to be, evaporates to less than a couple of cents. There, there may actually be some either unexplained or genuinely discriminatory, discriminatory uh, pieces to that puzzle. But when you control for all the variables, most of it vanishes. Well, for them, systemic racism is refusing to control for any of the variables and saying that racism somehow or another that maybe you can't even detect that hides in our subconsciouses uh, and manifests somehow materially anyway that's the real cause of everything. So when people ask me if I believe in systemic racism, I actually tell them, no, I do not. I think that it is a construct that's used uh, very much like if you're looking in a religious argument to the God of the gaps, that God is the explanation for everything that we can't explain. Uh, so systemic racism is the ex explanation for all 
of the inequities of a certain type, but not others, that occur racially um, when they don't have other adequate explanations. Uh, or if I decide to be cheeky, I point out, well, you are correct, though, that there, I wouldn't call it systemic racism, but there's institutional racism and all these failed progressive policies that have tried to help black people have contributed more to uh, these inequitable outcomes than almost anything in the past 50 years. Um, if we go before the Civil Rights Act, I grant you that. We were, we were genuinely largely a white supremacist society before 1964, uh, legally and even. Fine, I grant you that, but that is also 50 more or more years ago. So we need to kind of, you know, update the files a little bit, if you will. So no, um, you cannot separate systemic racism and critical race theory, I don't think. The, to talk about it in the systemic fashion is to say that you're using critical theory to analyze it. So they are, they are similar things, but the, if you want to have that conversation at home, you know, getting into this theory is just going to confuse people and upset people. You really just have to point out that systemic racism is the name of the cause mm -hmm. for all unexplained inequities of certain types, but not others. So it's a very uh, double standard kind of construction. Yeah, I would say that uh, that systemic racism is the object of knowledge for critical race theory. It's, it's, it's what they actually study. So once you posit that object of knowledge, you're effectively, uh, uh, you know, you're incorporating the the approach, which is critical race theory, because that that very notion uh, implies what critical race theory studies. And if you frame it in a different way, it's not critical race theory. I mean, you have to frame it as systemic, without which you're not doing critical race theory. How about they say this explicitly too, by the way, David. They they really do. They say this explicitly that when you have somebody stand up, I think they, they very frequently cite Ben Shapiro on this, stand up and say something like, I'm as against racism as anybody, but you have to show me where it is and then we'll fight it. If it's in the institution, let's fix it. If it's in the individual, let's intervene upon it. And then they say, of course though, this is just a trick. That this I've seen them say this. They say, this is a trick. They're saying that critical race theory is the study of systemic racism, even when no institutions and no um, individuals are racist in any way whatsoever, either in act or belief, or, but that there are still inequitable outcomes. And so the system is everything outside of that. And so when you say you have to show me where the racism is actually occurring, then you're actually taking critical race theory off the table and as they say, committing a category mistake. Mm -hmm. So they themselves, when they try to defend um, critical race theory and, and the approach and define systemic racism to do it, say, exactly what Michael just said, that the systemic racism is that which critical race theory says is the cause of all differences in outcomes yeah. for so-called minoritized groups that, that hurt them, but none of the ones that benefit them if those come into play. Without any input from institutions or individuals that's discernible. So critical race theory and systemic racism are, are inextricably linked together. And, and, my, yeah. and Michael put it very well, that if you want to frame the thing up differently, the critical race theorists themselves will say, well, see, you've just disqualified the entire point of our field of study. So of course it doesn't work. And so even they say that yeah. these things are synonymous. Yeah. And I want to be clear, you know, just from my perspective, I don't, I think they want to frame it if it's critical race theory versus the status quo. And I don't think we have to accept that framing I think we can acknowledge that there could be systemic injustices to our system. It is rigged for, you know, the regulation and state, you know, I'm just telling you my perspective. I'm uh, kind of a critic of statism and its intervention into all of our lives, rigging it for the few and, and using state intervention to, you know, make a casino type economy. But you could, so I guess I'm just trying to make that clear for people is that if you're talking to, you know, your, your fellow friend at school or you're talking to your, child who's going to learn this stuff and they're saying but dad but but hey uh you don't believe in systemic injustice you don't have to accept that frame you can say no i i do but i don't accept the frame that you're saying it is right i think Not only you should that, ask them what the system is just get yeah. them to define the system because it means everything right. because they'll say oh well look at the history and you say well okay the, that's a legacy but is that part of the the functioning system now and of course no and then say well let's look at the uh 
they say, well, the, the, the criminal justice system. You say, well, that is an institutional system, so that would be classified under institutional racism. But what if we were to have that in a position to where there were none? Would we still have systemic racism? The thing is that the, 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 de the definition of the system is everything that happens, including how we, how we think, uh, how, how we organize our language, what we consider to be truth, what we consider to be knowledge, what we consider to be knowable and not knowable. This is where we get back into that lived experience, the primacy of lived, lived experience, which is their interpreted lived experience because it's either authentic or inauthentic. So you have to try to get them to, to define this. This idea of the system is very vague. And so mm -hmm. if you nail them down to try to talk about what system do you mean and what do you want to do with it? And then you start to try to, I mean, if you're trying to have that conversation, it's, it always kind of has to point to where's your evidence and what practical steps can we take to uh, change things? And usually their answer is, well, we just have to change attitudes. And that's a, that's that's a weird weak answer that i mean that that's for totalitarianism more or less by by definition the other thing is that some some types of as, approaches to the system are, are are verboten though for example if you were to point out that uh lyndon b, uh, b. johnson's great society uh probably contributed more to the uh, uh the plight of uh black america than anything in the last 50 years that's disqualified uh, in advance, uh, because that is blaming the victim in some sense, I suppose, because it, you know this is what broke up the black family. This, this had more to do with the disintegration of the black family than any policy coming from the right. Uh, this policy separated fathers from families. And you know, looking at statistics, frankly, this is the number one uh, criteria for understanding criminality, uh, lack of uh, uh, pr prison set of prison time served, uh, lack of uh, education, and uh, other fact poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, th there's nothing corresponds as well to those particular outcomes than that particular factor. So my final two questions, we just want to get your take real quick, both of you. Um, what, you know, does, what's the future of humanities and social sciences and mm -hmm. academia? You know, like, where does it go from here? Where does it go 50 years? I mean, obviously, it can look a lot different in different ways, but how do these disciplines continue in the turn that they're taking? Um, just this, give me your assessment. This is, uh, I mean, I, I think that the humanities are, are, and the social sciences as well uh, are a disaster. I mean, to use Trumpian language, I, I'm afraid. Um, I think it's rotten to the core at this point. Um, I, I don't know what worth it has. It's, um, and I don't know how you, re, how you reinvigorate something that's rotten now. So how do you put anything back into what has been basically eroded to the point where, uh, you know, throwing around a concatenation of phrases that happen to have the right sound based on the sort of jargon that's being uh, promoted is really the basis, as, as uh, James and his colleagues have pointed out, that's the basis of the whole humanities, most of the humanities projects. This is what they're doing. I mean, you read this academic language, this jargon, this jargon-laden uh, plug-and-play rhetoric, it's pathetic. It is pathetic what's going on in the humanities. It's not worth doing. Uh, I got out of the field because it's not worth competing with nonsense. It just isn't worth it. Uh, I, pref I prefer you know, doing my own intellectual work outside of the academy because the academy uh, doesn't even register what I'm doing. Uh, it can't register because the kind of work that's being acknowledged is completely laden with this sort of, uh, uh, you know, not just jargon laden, but, you know, uh, this kind of uh, ethos of, of grievance uh, that's that's the key. Th that it has to be based in some sort of a grievance uh, field to study. It has to be based in a grievance uh, premise, and then it has to be. Uh, it has to have this particular. It has to have some sort of axe to grind, and it needs attachment to some sort of identity category. Uh, and then these are always shifting. I mean, it was querying the text five, ten years ago, but that that doesn't get you anywhere now. Uh, to queer the text and queer studies, I'm talking about. You know, these, these are fashionable, and it's just now become nothing but a series of uh, fashionable nonsense, to quote, uh, uh, I think it was one of the 
uh, critics of science studies, basically. Gross and Levitt, I think they called it fashionable nonsense. Um, and that is to say, it's just purely drapery. Uh, it's just drapery around with a particular under undergirding uh, ethos of grievance. And as long as you parrot, uh, parrot and uh, these phrases, these phrases, these plug and play phrases, it doesn't matter if there's any substance to what you're talking about. It's, it's pure rhetorical dressing. It's, it's a sham. Uh, I think the humanities and, and some of the social sciences are rotten to the core, I'm afraid. I, I, don't I would love you, to hear James's view on this. Yeah, I don't think you, you want to turn to me for optimism on this. Uh, <laughs> my first, uh, just to be completely, I know it's a bit coarse, but to be completely frank, when you were asking the question, David, the first thing I thought was in the toilet. Where do they go from here? Into the toilet. <laughs> yeah. That's more or, less, more or less the short answer of it. Um, I can't call him my friend yet, but the tough philosopher, uh, Tufts philosopher Dan Dennett once phrased uh, something very well. He said, if something's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. And mm -hmm. at this point, I, I, I'm actually grieved for the humanities. I think that there is much value in bringing out the human uh, in our different disciplines and in, in, even in interdisciplinary studies to find the human uh, in disciplines that most people don't think it is uh, to be found in like physics or mathematics. Yeah. I think that there's even more value to be had to dig into the to the humanity that we see typically in what we associate with the humanities, which is you know literature and, and analysis of art, and and I think that there there this particular set of critical approaches to the humanities have as as Michael said, completely rotten, rotted it out. There is no humanity left. There is only this attempt to look high-minded and academic and fashionable and frankly, um, bourgeois, as bourgeois as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, you've got, it's very emperor's new clothes level bourgeois. Uh, so fine and so fancy that there's literally nothing there. Um, so I don't see that the humanities as they exist have a positive future whatsoever. I do, however, think that we have a very vibrant new access to build different institutions. So I believe the, mm -hmm. the institutional humanities are in an institution that's luckily also crumbling at the exact moment that they've become fully corrupt. This also applies not to all, but to much of the social sciences, which need a tremendous reckoning. Um, but there is the opportunity for a robust approach to the humanities that has nothing to do with that, which will have to be separate from the academic um, machine for mm -hmm. some time until mm -hmm. it can establish itself and then be brought in out of the envy to have it back as a jewel of the academy. Mm -hmm. the, the, this can arise from the outside. So people outside of the academy need to start doing humanities mm -hmm. in the sense of evoking the human and helping find the human in that uh, that set of activities that we normally associate with the humanities and, and with all human activity and to to promote the the positive not necessarily critical sides of that and dig into that and, and and kind of bring that back to life but within the disciplines themselves i think that the cause is lost the, into the toilet they go um as far as the social sciences i feel very much like they're obviously very very young as far as sciences go the they're still more philosophy than they are uh, rigorous science, though some good strides have been made. Obviously, this is a, a question of complexity. The things that they study are extraordinarily complex uh, and very difficult to study rigorously. I'm often put in a position when I'm asked about that, about the social sciences. I think of the birth of geology with, with mm -hmm. Lyell. Mm -hmm. And there is this huge controversy, this big fight between what were called the Vulcanists and the Neptunians. It sounds like a Star Trek episode. The catastrophists and the uh, gradualists. Yeah, the yeah. Uniformitarians, and uniformitarians and gradualists. Yeah. Right. And so they had this gigantic yeah. argument in particular within that uh, broader argument. I mean, this was to the point where they were cancel culturing each other's family members who had you know, artistic plays being presented in theaters and things like this. They would show up and boo and throw things. And then there was cancel culture. This was, you know, cancel culture in the early uh, 19th century. And finally, Lyell brought them together in some kind of a conference in the, the, about the specific question of what is the seafloor basalt? 
how is that formed? What is it made of? Is it, is it the result of volcanic activity or the result of condensation from the seawater itself? And Lyle had this ridiculous notion at the time, which was instead of putting forth these theories and arguing about them and throwing things at each other and calling each other names and slandering one another, let's go look at rocks. And we have not yet had that revolution in the social sciences. And until that um, adamant commitment to say, we are going to look at evidence, we're in fact going to reject Marx is what it boils down to. Marx, yeah. the point of, of studying society is in fact to understand it, not to change it. Okay. Exactly. Until well, that good. happens, yeah. the social sciences also are, it's like the social sciences, it's again a crude analogy, but since I brought up the toilet, it's like they're standing in the toilet trying to flush themselves down, but they won't go. Um, <laughs> And they need to just get out of the pot, basically, um, and, and get rigorous. That's the way that I, I think I have to see both of those kinds of, of disciplines. And, and the humanities have got to renew themselves from the outside. Mm -hmm. And the universities, I think, until they cut that albatross off from their necks, are going to lose status. They're going to lose uh, tr public trust. And they're going to continue to watch what is definitely happening, which is that these these activists pretending, pretending to be humanities scholars are going to continue to infect other fields and, and even into the hard sciences and undermine those. Uh, they say explicitly that's their goal. They have said explicitly that's their goal. One of our peer reviewers and one of our fake papers said explicitly that was their goal. Uh, they have a paper that came out in 2016 comparing themselves to viruses like Ebola and HIV and saying mm -hmm. that they hope that the virus causes cancer in other disciplines because cancer equals transformational change, that mm. this is what they are doing. And, and so I think the universities, in fact, are going to have to just cut the cord and let those, let the humanities drop away, and they're going to have to be renewed from the outside. I agree entirely. In fact, I, in fact, I think that the ca case of the, you know, the penetration into the STEM fields is, is pretty, already pretty significant in the mm -hmm. sense that I mean, if you go back to uh, the Sokol hoax, which you felt, which you, you guys uh, so so well elaborated, and what did you say? It's the Sokol hoax squared. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you go back to the Sokol hoax, you can see already that the postmodern theoretical uh, project had uh, infiltrated science studies, as it was called, and began to uh, it, you know to have an effect on uh, the way science is understood, at least in the public sphere if not only in the academy, uh, perhaps also in the public sphere. And they were, so there were what they called the science boosters who rose up to basically, you know, and, and, and Sokol was one of the major ones with the Sokol hoax. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, and you already see in, in engineering, for example, there was a professor of engineering at Indiana, I think it was, or Purdue, she was at Purdue, and she is condemning uh, rigor in engineering because it's masculinist. And, and she even invokes the erection as a, a symbol of the masculinist uh, uh, aspect of engineering. And so imagine if engineering gets infiltrated by this stuff and you know, basically we're going to have death by diversity in effect, death by, uh, death by theory and you know, you're, you know, bridges falling down because they, you know, rigor has been rejected uh, and so on and so forth. So there are real stakes. To yeah, if I might put an exclamation mark on that. This summer, I rather inadvertently, although it's fun to pretend I was a mastermind at this, I uh, rather inadvertently got a, a fair swath of these, um, these academic frauds to very publicly begin to defend the proposition that two plus two need not equal four. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, specifically to defend the pr proposition that it can equal five. And you t so this is whatever it happens to be, but it turns out in the, the, the development of this, you could say, oh, it was just on Twitter, but it's not because many of the people that were arguing it are the architects of our educational programs in states like Washington that are all in on this. But even if we, we grant that, eventually it's of course just popular press, but popular mechanics of all things writes an article saying, yes, indeed, two plus two can equal five. And then to make this, to put that exclamation point where it belongs, the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health shared the article and said, if you ever wanted to know how two plus two can in fact equal five, this is a school of public health mm -hmm. tweeting two plus two equals five, sharing an article endorsing that view in the middle of a pandemic. 
So we are actually talking about the possibility of death by theory, mm -hmm. um, regardless of what engineers do. Our public health, I saw the other day that STEM plus social justice equals public health. And so mm -hmm. social justice here being critical theories of social mm -hmm. justice, as a matter of fact. And so we now have our public health, which of course is not quite a science, our public health field, and then dipping deeply into medicine. Look at the, the leading medical journals, New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, Cell. Yeah. They are all publishing articles on this in every issue now. Uh, these critical theory articles, critical theory of medicine now is mainstreaming in top medical journals. Mm. We have schools of public health openly saying things like that epidemiology needs to, to be using things like specifically critical race theory, um, mm. uh, epidemiologist, I forget where she is, Boston University or something like that, uh, had a whole presentation about that, that that received quite a bit of support from fellow epidemiologists that critical race theory is a necessary component now of epidemiology. And again, we're in a pandemic that is literally killing hundreds of thousands of Americans. Yeah. And it's probably in physics too, with they're probably saying gravity is racist and so forth <laughs> at this point. But the way that it usually goes in physics and mathematics is that they say that it's clear that the community is is filled with racism and sexism that, that creates biases, which then in turn affects what questions are asked and who determines what right answers are. But even more than they say that the underlying premises of the fields themselves, this is where you see the erection thing in uh, engineering, the underlying premises of the field themselves must inform that community somehow. So the underlying premises of the field have to be changed. Uh, I don't know that people would go quite as far as saying that gravity doesn't it, I mean, that it holds people down. I mean, you could go there very easily. <laughs> now, Foucault's whole point was that, um, you know, scientific power, uh, biopower, as he often referred to it, um, has the habit of, or believing in scientific discourses, has the habit of constraining potentialities of being, mm -hmm. uh, as he put them. And so gravity definitely constrains your potential. I mean, I had a, a friend when I was in, in high school who's like neighborhood kid, I don't really use my friend, I barely knew him, but he ended up taking PCP and he unconstrained his potentialities of being rather significantly, ended up jumping off his roof and breaking both legs uh, mm -hmm. because gravity didn't care uh, about mm -hmm. his potentialities of being, being unconstrained. So they may go that far, they may not, but usually it's that they wanna dig at the premises and the goal, like we talked about earlier, is just to find excuses to install themselves in positions of yeah. cultural production, power and influence. Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I, I want to leave just with a w one quick note from both of you. Is there any intellectual project or theory that you're seeing, maybe it's been in the past or it's coming up now, that you think could be an intellectual counterweight to scratch the itch for both a theoretical framework for justice as well as uh, just a, a more rigorous approach to the, 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 the questions that are being raised by this space? I'll tell you, my, my candidate I'm hoping for, I think mimetic theory by Rene Girard has a promise. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know, you know, Rene Girard ironically unleashed a lot of the French postmodern thinkers into uh, North America in his famous uh, John Hopkins University um, uh, event where he brought in a lot of the folks uh, and kind of introduced them to the American academia and they took off a lot faster than anybody thought, I guess. But but I mean, that's just my opinion. Perhaps there's an intellectual project that you guys can shed light on so people have something to-, to Well, well something, something is going, in order to not look regressive, you know, because this is, this is all seen as the per leading edge of, uh, of, of academia. So in order to not look like some sort of retrograde movement, uh, whatever it is has to sort of surmount uh, postmodern theory has to surmount critical theory. It can't just ignore it. It has to, uh, it has to overcome it, right? So it can't be some sort of return back to some sort of modernism. So uh, I, I've actually posed this very question and I was uh, about to put an anthology together where various scholars were going to uh, propose alternatives. And one of them, I th one of them is metamodern, metamodernism, uh, which, which, uh, takes into consideration, at least, some of the observations or, or propositions of postmodernism, but overcomes them entirely. Uh, that is a possibility, but it, like I said, it, it, it must be something that uh, sub, sub, uh, sublates, if you will, to use a, a, a Marxian term, 
uh, or a mark often used term under Marxism, and that is it both absorbs and overthrows at the same time, because otherwise it's going to look, you know, like retrenchment, and that won't work. Simply from the standpoint that there's the progress narrative uh, that underlies all of this, this idea that there is some sort of a, this is the leading edge, and you, this is why these theories come out of the highest echelons of academia first, you know. For example, postmodern theory first was instituted at Yale in the United States in the English department there. Uh, so, uh, or deconstruction in particular. Uh, so, it has to be something that doesn't look rear guard, uh, I would say. And it has to have a sort of, uh, and that is not to say that it should strictly be fashion based on fashion, but it has to, it has to not, if not incorporate, it must deal with these questions. It must deal with them and overcome them. Sure, yeah. I think in different different domains, there are different things to talk about with regard to this. I generally agree with what Michael said. I don't know what the exact theory going forward is, and I don't know that it's actually been articulated yet. Um, I'm familiar slightly with metamodernism, but I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm well versed in it, so I can't speak specifically to that. I uh, could say that there are a lot of pieces. So ultimately, I think that we have developed the right social, intellectual, and even economic architecture with the classical liberalism that would be the rear guard that Michael was bringing up. And you can't just default back to that. I also think that it has evolved more than people think it has due to um, people who are much more more reasonable having stolen some of the pieces from critical theory analysis, uh, Thomas Kuhn, for example, in his analysis of scientific revolutions. Clearly, they like to cherry pick from him. It's clear that he also derived some of his thinking from being able to look at the question of scientific thought and knowledge in a different way. That's, I think, to the best, uh, I think it's been the best articulated kind of or in its maturity by uh, Stephen Hawking before he died with Leonard Laudano. And in, in they, they put it in their popular book, The Grand Design, 2012. Uh, and they call it model dependent realism. So as far as the philosophy of science goes, we have a recognition that there is a barrier between strict kind of modernist positivist uh, mm -hmm. objective reality in the sense that the model itself is a socially constructed entity, but that we don't have to throw the realism out to accept that fact. And sure. so it, within the philosophy of science, I would actually say that the model dependent realism is the place to look and to continue to develop um, as far as the social aspect goes, I, of course, have to point to a couple of my, my I guess, friends now, John Haidt with uh, Greg Lukanoff and their coddling of the American mind, point out essentially how this, uh, this entire theory has led to a backwards approach to dealing with, you know, the psychology and sociology of, of education in particular, but uh, how we deal with certain issues. So we're talking about trying to reinvigorate a new dignity culture. And then my, my friend Nicholas Christakis has written a brilliant book called um, Blueprint that starts talking about networks. And I think that that's actually the key. Uh, one of my big observations that I think that I've finally settled upon, and I, I go back and I look at Foucault in this, this light, not as much Derrida, who's a bit of a fruitcake, but yeah. um, I look at Foucault and I think, wow, this guy was really actually perceptive on a lot of things way ahead of his time. And in particular, I think that social media makes for postmodernism's playground. And so a re-articulation of those classical liberal principles that I think Jonathan Rausch put the best in Kindly Inquisitors in 1992, updated for the fact that we have to use the kind of network understanding that people like Nicholas Christakis are putting out in books like Blueprint, we have to figure out a way to re-articulate liberal principles in a situation where we now have these very expansive social networks that allow for, for example, Antifa and Black Lives Matter, if you try to criticize them, we even saw this in the presidential debate, though it's, it, anti, Joe Biden said Antifa is not an organization, it's an idea. Well, no, it's a decentralized syndicate is what it is. Yeah. And um, the social media makes that extraordinarily easy to have organizations that are not technically organizations. So we now have to rearticulate liberal principles in the light of the fact that social media and the internet have fundamentally, and even jet air, airplanes and affordable travel, have fundamentally changed the nature of the world and of political governance and so on. So I think that rearticulating liberal principles in light of 
what will have to be a very, you know, advanced and advancing network theory that can incorporate the understandings of how networks actually work. And I think that's kind of what, if you look at um, Zygmunt Bauman's liquid modernity, you kind of can get hints that there's something about this network thing going on. If you look at kind of the, he's a bit of a lunatic, but Marshall McLuhan was predicting this decades in advance, that the, the, the networks provided by mass broadcast and now universal broadcast with the internet and social media have changed the nature of our, our societies and our interactions in a, in a fundamental and profound way. And then we can find a way to update the fundamentally liberal principles, whatever pathway, whether it's mimetic theory, whether it's metamodern, whatever path, or liquid modernity, I don't particularly like. But if we look at those as inspirations, as, as kind of signposts pointing in certain directions, how can we get back to those core principles that, that um, enable individualism, uh, that enable empiricism and, and rationality to the fullest extent, also taking into, into light the neuroscience that's showing that we're much less rational and much more social than we ever thought. For example, thinking fast and slow, or as it got derived um, into moral tribes by Joshua Green, you see this idea that you know we're very intuitive, we're very social. So we have to start to update for what I would consider to be the kind of naive error of the Enlightenment, where the the, the Enlightenment I think over relied upon people's uh, it's true and false that they over relied on people's ability to be rational when it comes to it. And the way that they, they that that's false, by the way, is that they talked about it constantly, but they talked about it in terms of the unwashed masses where all of the elites in society clearly are able to be rational all the time. The cultured people get to be rational and critical theory in a sense could be understood as a, re, a badly done reaction to that hubris. Yeah. And so I think we're kind of formulating the right the right places but those are the those are kind of the the building blocks that's the primordial soup that if we shake it up and hit it with a lightning bolt maybe we're going to get the the second enlightenment out of this that deals with the social media environment and that will be the thing that that reawakens humanity and prevents us from falling back into this sort of uh i don't know identity-based uh feudalism that's feudalism. attempting to take over dark ages of identity politics Wow, well, this has been a real uh, fantastic discussion. I really learned things, and uh, I hope our audience will as well. And I want people to follow uh, Dr. Rechtenwald at michaelrechtenwald.com. Keep up with his work there, uh, his various uh, books you can check out. And also, James Lindsay, you follow him at newdiscourses.com. That's your website where you've got different courses, right? Newdiscourses.com. Well, very good. Thanks a lot, guys, for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.